First of all, let me uh, uh, just thank you all for, for participating in this. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for, uh, for, for myself, for Jim, for James, for Scott, uh, and for Bert, uh, who are here, and the others that are coming to, to get to work and interact with, uh, with such a, an impressive group of students. And that actually is an idle flattery, since I read literally every single application, <laughs> and so uh, of which there were about 166 uh, total to begin with. So uh, uh, it is, it is, it's very nice to have you here. Uh, so what I want to do in this lecture is uh, give you a somewhat idiosyncratic overview of uh, intergenerational mobility. Now, I say idiosyncratic in the sense for a couple of reasons. One of them is. Um, in economics, uh, there is relatively little research on intergenerational mobility in comparison to cross-sectional inequality and uh, life cycle inequality. That's obviously not to say there isn't any. That's why I had a survey paper uh, distributed. But if you think about it for a second, there was a single chapter that, to summarize all the research uh, in economics on intergenerational mobility in a handbook that every chapter of which had to do with equality, inequality. And so, uh, yeah, so it is, uh, I think, a relatively underdeveloped area within economics, and so, uh, for better or worse, uh, I'm going to try to uh, uh, be a little bit speculative on uh, on how various aspects of, uh, of social science can be brought to bear to make it a richer literature, which is not uh, a criticism of extant work so much as an observation that the division of labor in uh, among inequality researchers, I think, is not adequately addressed. Uh, 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 intergenerational issues. So uh, the first thing uh, that I, I wanted to emphasize uh, is that uh, in talking about intergenerational mobility, there are logically distinct questions from simply understanding cross-sectional inequality and life cycle inequality. Nevertheless, there isn't a uh, orthogonality between them, and so it's you know the thought experiments. In some sense, you have to ask the question at a particular frequency of observation, uh, what are the appropriate models that one wants to use to approximate the phenomena? So if I wanted to understand fluctuations in daily income, I would use a very different model to understand uh, fluctuations over the life cycle. Similarly, I may want to use different models to understand intergenerational mobility as opposed to uh, something about the, uh, 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 the life cycle itself. And so part of what I want to do in the lecture uh, in this talk is describe uh, what I'm going to call, if you'll forgive me, a stochastic process view of the, of the phenomena. And what that means is I'm just going to write down a sequence of, uh, of Markov processes in which the T's are parents and offspring, and then uh, try to use this, uh, this mathematical framework to push into it uh, various uh, perspectives that have been taken in the literature. Uh, and uh, let me say that the Black and Devereaux uh, survey, I think, is actually a very good one in terms of where the economics literature is in terms of empirical work. Uh, in terms of theoretical work on intergenerational mobility, it is really quite scattered. In other words, there are, uh, are you know, uh, d different papers that focus on different mechanisms, but there has not been any, uh, in my view, uh, systematic in integration of the different perspectives to sort of think about what in equilibrium is going to be the, uh, the degree of intergenerational mobility. All right, so uh, uh, I want to answer the uh, question that uh, uh, was asked by uh, Alan earlier, which is why does inequality matter? Uh, in, but I'm asking more narrowly is I want to make a few comments as to why intergenerational mobility is a particular interest. And I want to make uh, four distinct arguments. Uh, the first, uh, James Foster alluded, uh, referred to, and that is that if one looks in the political philosophy literature, on, uh, in particular, in thinking about distributive justice, you know, issues of what uh, what represents a fair distribution of income, et cetera, the current literature has very much focused not on equality of outcomes per se, but on equality of opportunity, and so. Much of this has actually been spearheaded by an economist, John Romer, but philosophers such as Richard Arneson would be associated with this uh, school of thought. Now, the background to that is that, in th is that inequality, to sort of say is it good or bad, is the same thing as asking is a high price good or bad or is a high quantity good or bad. Okay, the serious point being inequality is simply an equilibrium outcome of a system in which there's a set of factors producing individual outcomes and by implication distributions of outcomes and the like. 
And so that from the perspective of asking justice questions, one then has to step back and ask questions such as, is the distribution in some sense fair? And the focus of the equality of opportunity folks is, roughly speaking, on the notion of desert as a basis for, uh, for what one receives. And so the idea is, do you get what you deserve? And so if I said to you, for example, that uh, I have two people doing exactly the same job, one's male, one female, and I've decided to pay the female 50%, uh, it's easy to say that is unjust because the person is not getting what they deserve because we have a set of moral intuitions which can be formalized that say that they ought to get, receive exactly the same compensation. All right, and so what happens in this literature is that what becomes essential in thinking about just versus unjust types of inequality is to somehow determine which factors for an individual's outcome, do we hold them responsible for, and which ones do we not hold them responsible for? And so once one has that dichotomy as operational in terms of the justice considerations, then intergenerational mobility becomes very natural, since you're not responsible for who your parents are, you're not responsible for your DNA, let alone the, uh, uh, the school that you, uh, the elementary school you go to, so on and so forth. And so issue number one is that when it, immediately, if you sort of look at the current uh, literature on egalitarianism and distributive justice, equality of opportunity becomes the, uh, the locus of consideration. Once you're there, you naturally look at the dichotomy between things one is held responsible for and one things one ought not to be held responsible for. And so intergenerational considerations then come into the, uh, come into the fore. Now the second comment is that I think that uh, it is, you know, certainly work by uh, Jim and, and, and others have shown the importance of early childhood investments in, uh, in long run socioeconomic outcomes. And so there's a, a sense in which I believe that if you think about the focus of the literature just in trying to understand, you know, behaviors within the life cycle, the determinants of, econo of labor market success, et cetera, there's increasing recognition that these quote unquote uh, unjustified inequalities play a first order role in outcomes. And so uh, when one is thinking about how early childhood development is uh, associated with long-term consequences, for example, in other words, the positive research that's being done in understanding labor market outcomes and, or in a whole host of socioeconomic outcomes, they sort of naturally fall into the consideration of intergenerational mobility questions because they ultimately come down to statements that there's something about the parents. It could be income, though there's reasons to think that the direct income channel is, is tricky. But there's going to be issues of the, you know, the community a parent is able to generate around their child, et cetera, all of which are going to affect this broad range of cognitive and non-cognitive skills. And so intergenerational mobility sort of naturally drops out of the, uh, of the modern positive research. All right, now the third point I want to make uh, argument is the following, and that is there is an alternative perspective in political philosophy that uh, would, uh, would, would, would link uh, ethical considerations with the early childhood development work. And, that's what I, and so this is going to be my very idiosyncratic interpretation of the capabilities approach. So the capabilities approach, which is you know, uh, you know, pioneered by Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum, uh, very crudely speaking says the following, and that is that what, what matters, what justice is going to be about, is ensuring that individuals have the capabilities to have a flourishing life. Okay, those sound like somewhat vague words, but, and they obviously, the point of the philosophy, the, the writings is to instantiate them with you know, specific implications. But if one thinks about uh, you know, what, what one wants society to do, from that perspective, you suddenly see that there's an implication of the early childhood development work for uh, you know, what represents a good society. In other words, the early childhood work says families affect this range of cognitive and non-cognitive skills, and those are going to constitute the sorts of capabilities that, that Sen and Nussbaum focus on. And so if somebody has a very uh, disadvantaged uh, environment, and they aren't able to develop the capacity, let's say, for, of self-control, reflective thought, the ability to uh, uh, be patient, form beliefs about the future, et cetera. All of these are non-cognitive skills. 
they consequently aren't going to be able to lead flourishing lives in the sense that, uh, that uh, Sen and Nussbaum talk about it. And so, in a, put it differently, the capabilities approach does not focus on equality of opportunity. That's not key to it. What's key to it is the capacity for individuals to have flourishing lives. Now, that, you might say, well, isn't that equality? No, it's something different. It's called prioritarianism. And so the idea basically is that you put priority on the disadvantage to make sure that they can have some minimal level of achievement. And so it's not inequality, as, um, as Alan uh, brought up before, that is the object that one's one worried about so much. Rather, one is worried about the capacity of all members of, as, of society to, to lead uh, f flourishing lives. Now, interestingly enough, this actually links back to um, uh, uh, <laughs> very, uh, uh, creates links, uh, as I said, strangely enough, between neuroscience and virtue ethics, and I could even say Aristotle and Confucius. This is actually isn't pure pedantry. Uh, the point, the serious point is the following, is there is another school of ethical thought, which capabilities approach actually is part of, and that is what is called virtue ethics. And so the idea there is, you ask the question, how do you construct a society in which people have the capacity to act virtuously? And so the emphasis uh, in much of these write of the writings, in, uh, which you know date back, uh, you know, 2,500 years, uh, is on ideas that can be interpreted as variants of, of capabilities ideas, which is not to say there hasn't been progress, but uh, merely that there's a certain logical continuity, and further. Again, it emphasizes the importance of early childhood development of non-cognitive skills. And so a quote-unquote virtuous person, remember this is a very broad-based definition, is going to include the capacity to make reflective decisions, to conceptualize the future, so on and so forth. And so I think that uh, the intergenerational mobility issues actually, because of the, not the non-cognitive dimension of them, speak very much to uh, both virtue ethics and and, and capabilities theory. Okay, the fourth comment simply is that obviously uh, intergenerational mobility has important uh, political consequences. So to give you an example, there's a very nice paper by uh, Benabu and Oki who show, ask the following question, which is why is it the people that are relatively disadvantaged are not voting for very high taxes to redistribute things? And so they introduce the idea of the quote, possibility of upward mobility. In other words, I choose to vote, for, uh, I, I would prefer a low tax regime even if I don't, uh, have much money because, damn it, I am sure that my children are going to be millionaires. Uh, interestingly enough, in, in 1972, uh, George McGovern was running for president. Uh, he uh, proposed a 100% inheritance tax uh, for incomes over a million dollars. And the, uh, if you looked in the polls as to who hated it, the, was most opposed to it, it was not the rich. <laughs> it was, was blue-collar workers. Why? Because it didn't apply to them, but they believed it was going to apply to their offspring. And so that, uh, that anecdote is formalized in the Benabu uh, Oki work. And uh, I would you know, I don't think it's fanciful to think, for example, that if one's comparing uh, the relative lack of redistribution in the United States versus Europe, that part and parcel with perceptions concerning social mobility. In other words, we're willing to tolerate a lot of inequality at a point in time because we think that the uh, social mobility is relatively high. In fact, and one of the reasons that intergenerational mobility analysis is getting a lot of public press is the argument that that myth, that that uh, assertion about American society versus Europe uh, is not factual. Okay, again, I don't take a stance so much on that, but just to make that as an observation. Okay, let me make one comment on interdisciplinary differences. Uh, and uh, there are three, uh, three sociologists here. And that is, economists tend to focus on income as the object of interest in terms of mobility. Uh, in contrast, the, uh, the sociology literature tends to focus on occupations. Now, obviously, neither of these is correct. As Jim mentioned in his opening talk, if we're going to think about inequality either at a point in time, over the life cycle, or across generations, there's, ob uh, there's a full vector of objects that are going to be of natural interest. One thing to keep in mind is once you take that perspective, it is not obvious that the same model that you would apply to understand income mobility is the one you would use for occupational mobility. I could tell you different stories about the way that uh, information about occupations may transmit from parent to offspring that would make a tighter link between the occupational relationships than the income relationships per se. Okay. And so, uh, again, I just want to make this as an observation. Uh, 
neither side's right, neither side's, it's not a matter of being right or wrong, they're just different orientations. Okay, so, uh, so what I want to do is the following then, is I want to give you an overview of the sty some, st some stylized facts, Jim's already mentioned them, uh, and I'm just going to be slightly more long-winded about them. And then I want to put them in the context of candidate uh, uh, models. Now, I'm going to do this in a loosey-goosey fashion, and what I mean by that is I'm going to write down one fully articulated model that says, okay, good neoclassical economics is exactly why you would get a correlation between parents and offspring. Uh, but for our purposes, what matters is I want to take that and say, well, what's missing? And then, and then talk about alternative factors that one would build into it. Okay. So the canonical analysis in economics um, is uh, to essentially the, the object of interest is the so-called intergenerational earnings elasticity in which uh, one looks at the relationship between the, uh, uh, some measure, typically the log of, of income of the parent and the log of income of the offspring. Now, if you run that regression, obviously, if I normalize the variances, I just get a correlation. And so sometimes you see interest in the intergenerational correlation coefficient. And so a remarkably high percentage of empirical research by economists on intergenerational mobility, that's a long-winded uh, phrase, is focused on getting estimates of this object rho. And part of, and the evolution of that literature is having to do with what those values of rho are. So uh, before 1990, the typical estimate one saw in the literature uh, was something between 0.2 and 0.3. And that led to a phrase, I don't know if, if it was due to Gary Becker or it was just like a conventional phrase, uh, uh, called shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. So the idea was uh, in three generations, wherever the... Uh, an individual was as descendants, you just didn't see much trace of their relative success. And it's obvious from the structure of this model, which is linear, why that's happening. If you take 0.3 and you square it, uh, I suddenly have 0.09, which is a very radical attenuation of the relationship between my income and that of my grandchildren. And so that was, the, you know, that was really why there was a, a perception of very high social mobility uh, generated by a model of this type. Now, as Jim mentioned, what has happened in the modern literature, and there's a sequence of papers that do this, and the literature evolved first with work by David Zimmerman and Gary Solon, and it's uh, kind of the state of the arts, uh, Bashkar Mazumdar's work. The thought experiment was to say that, well, when we think about income, uh, we want to distinguish, as you all know from uh, first year macro, I hope, that, <laughs> that there's an important distinction between permanent income and transitory income. So in other words, if you measure income at a point in time and the reason you, your income is at that level is because you won the lottery, that's quite different than because you actually have a salary of a million dollars a year because after all, you're not going to win the, next, the uh, lottery next year, but you are going to get the salary next year. And so what has been done is to try to somehow decompose income into these permanent and transitory components and then look at the correlations of the permanent income components. Okay, the way that's been done operationally is to take long-run averages uh, for individuals. So you don't, look at a, an in, you don't take the parent's income in one year, you take it for many years, you average it together, and the assertion is that if you have enough observation, a long enough time span, the transitory incomes average out to zero, and that's going to somehow clean out this, uh, this transitory role. And Mazumdar ends up with estimates that are around 0.6. Now those are, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, that is really qualitatively quite different because after all, if I take 0.6 and square it, I get 0.36, which was higher than the initial estimate <laughs> that was uh, uh, often bleated about, which was 0.2 or 0.3. Okay, and furthermore, even if I go, uh, you know, four generations out, I get a number that was in the interval of the original literature. Please. And do these control for locality? There's discussion of trying to deal with, um, you know, local differences in prices, et cetera. Um, so, uh, why should you go back to your parents living in Louisiana? Or Louisiana? Oh, it makes it makes sense, but there's the, the, the issue is the question is, um, how do, do I just put in a state effect? Then it kind of begs the question why the. I could say that the correlation between parent and offspring is a parent chose to live in, the, in a state that's going to generate a low wage for themselves and, and their offspring. But your question is salient for the following reason, and that is 
this is an equilibrium object and whether or not I put in a control variable for state, so on and so forth, by itself it tells us absolutely, well, to be blunt, nothing in terms of underlying mechanisms. Okay? I, in other words, there's a story that was just given. Each state has a different income level. Okay? There's no relationship between parent and offspring income. However, because of lack of migration in this hypothetical example, I would find a correlation across, across the country in incomes simply because of the lack of migration. Okay? And so uh, that's a very nice example of what you know, is, the, is the gap in this literature. In other words, that one has you know, increasingly sophisticated efforts to measure the relationship uh, between parental, offspring, uh, parental income and offspring income. And when I say increasingly sophisticated, dealing with measurement error, dealing with nonlinearities, so on and so forth, with very little attention to the question of mechanisms. And so that's what I, when I made the earlier comment that inequality per se is just, it's a thing that happens as a source of many factors. This, you know, the, and Jim again mentioned that in his lecture. Uh, there has been remarkably little work trying to decompose these various measures that exist for intergenerational mobility or persistence into, into what is actually determining it. So the way to think about your example was you just raised an identification problem. Well, I'm just asking, do you, you have estimates for state, state age or the all, or the all I don't recall uh, whether or not people put in state dummies. They do account for local uh, price differences. Because remember, if the wages are lower, maybe the prices are also lower. Yeah. I mean, just man, I just jump. In a sense, you're already doing it by limiting it to a country, and so you've already made it based on an, a regional location. Yeah. But so there's some issues in in terms of going to the world as opposed to. Yeah. Just, I'm not going to say anything about the world in this talk, James. Uh. So, uh, do, has anybody estimated this with a? Um, with uh, uh, grandfathers on the right-hand side as well, so. There's very limited work because you may be shocked to hear this. There's very little data which you have more than one generation. Uh, there are some British uh, data which uh, let you do that because you guys were very good at keeping records and you've been around a lot longer than us. Uh, the second point is there's been some work, uh, actually the late Linda Daxter Lowry uh, was looking specifically at grandparent effects and found, interestingly, that granddaughter income was sensitive to grandmother's uh, educational status, for example. And so they're, they're, the problem is simply with limited data sets, looking at the more extended uh, uh, family, uh, uh, family tree influences is, is tricky business. Yes. Yeah. Pardon me? The South African studies are new for Okay, there we go. This has more to do with family structure. It's more like a festival. No, in fact, there's nonlinearities that that's kind of where the literature is it look is trying to identify nonlinearities. Uh, actually, I think they are interesting because you find something you won't be shocked to hear, which is the tails are more persistent than the middle. And so, but that's an important fact. And, uh, and so that's the sort of phenomenon one when, when observes when one does richer work of that form. I'll talk about nonlinearities later in, in a little bit more detail. I want you to see, however, there was already a problem with this. And that is that uh, it skipped something that would seem to be very important. It assumed, actually, that every family has the same long run every family dynasty metaphorically has the same long run uh, income. In other words, by s assuming that there's a single row which describes the persistence and a single kappa which was whatever set the mean in the system, you've actually ruled out a lot of sources of inequality that we're naturally interested in. If I'm concerned about racial inequality, where is that embedded in this model? So on and so forth. So in other words, and in fact, much of the work on the theory side is not about rho, it's trying to understand why there are kappa differences. And so, that, and so it's really rho and kappa in, together that tell you what the income distribution is going to look like and then it, and, or it was going to tell you what the income distribution in the steady state of dynasties looks like and will also tell you something about you know, the way that relative rankings evolve across time. Okay, so 
All right, so that's, that's really the, the simplest background, and that is, as I said, economists spending enormous amounts of time trying to estimate this linear regression coefficient, worrying deeply about measurement error, uh, with some recent work that's trying to take nonlinearity seriously. Uh, of, of that work, much of it is, uh, if you'll forgive me, flawed because it does things like put squares in and says that's the nonlinearity, whereas it's the nonparametric work, which is, I think, more persuasive. So my vision of the nonlinear, as I said, is that a lot of mobility in the middle, less in the tails. All right, so what I want to, uh, so that, that, that's the background. Okay, we have this object that seems to be of natural interest. And then I want to say, if, you know, sort of ask, well, what sort of models have economists proposed to describe this? And so I want to give you the classical model and then describe what, uh, in distinction to the classical model, uh, is done in, in more current research. So the classical model is, is family-based, and it's based on income. And so the idea is that you think of the population as a set of independent dynasties. Okay. And so the issue is going to be that across family dynasties, you look at the income process. And then I see, well, how persistent it is. Or if I have two dynasties, I could ask the question such as if, you, if you're richer than him, uh, what's that say about your great-grandchildren in terms of probabilities? I'll flip it if you want. But uh, either way, I needed one to be, or if you're equal, what's the implications for the future? OK, so the two classical papers, one is by Becker and Tomes, and the other is by Glenn, Low by Glenn Lowry. And they really are, are very simple. Uh, first of all, the, now the sociologists get to laugh uh, because the, in order to make, you know, uh, remember you want theory to be simple but not too simple as Einstein said. The way these models are structured is they ignore issues of assortative matching. In fact, they absorb uh, mating, excuse me. They absorb, they ignore issues of mating. <laughs> so the thought experiment is that you have this, this uh, single being who has a single child and lives two periods. And so that's called an overlapping generations model. And that's why I use her every place, because last time I checked, uh, <laughs> if there aren't two, it's, uh, it better be a her. OK, and so uh, all issues of uh, intermarriage, in other words, uh, sort of matching are ignored. Fecundity is ignored. That's going to turn out to be important later on. And so we just have this idea that an individual is born, their first period is childhood, second period is adulthood, and they die. And so what's the question I'm going to ask? What's the relationship between? the income of a parent and the income of an offspring. So the way you construct the model, a model of this type, I think you all know, and that is that, you know, again, these are going to be extremely simplified models because they want to sort of get to a point where then you can then think about empirical work. First idea is going to be that as an adult, an income divides her, uh, an adult divides her income between consumption and investment in the child. Okay, so this is, this is really uh, just an identity. I'm going to refer to something called YPOV. So the idea is, uh, without dealing with the measurement issues, we have somehow come to a consensus, this is the level of income you need to be said to be out of poverty. All right, so that's idea number one. Idea number two is that the uh, parent's income is somehow, because they're optimized, you know, somehow they're trading off their consumption against something about their children, whatever it is they care about, it could be the child's education, the child's utility, the child's income, what that leads to is a relationship between the parent's income and the level of investment in the child. Okay, and that's assumed to be uh, under suitable regularity conditions, uh, which is a fancy way of saying don't worry about it, it's non-negative. Uh, it's it's going to be increasing. Okay, so you take those two, and then finally you need some sort of model, as it were, description of how human capital is translated into income for the next generation. And so algebraically, you just say that the simplest way to say it is the income of an adult is determined by the human capital they received as a child and all the stuff I can't explain, unobserved heterogeneity. Now, I've been careful in the way I describe the unobserved heterogeneity as I wanted to say it's orthogonal. It occurs in adulthood. It's orthogonal to everything known at time t. Now, why do I put that in? It's just to make life easy. Because after all, if I'm an adult and I knew this epsilon for my child, that may affect how much I invest in them. It's not clear what the way that it would go. You might say, well, if the kid's very gifted, I really want to invest a lot of human capital because the payoff's high. On the other hand, I could say, you know, the the child is not gifted. I have to invest a lot to make sure they have uh, some, some, uh, some particular living standard. So to avoid those types of complexities, I, 
I'm very careful. That's why there's all these I's dotted and T's crossed in terms of how to set an information structure. All right, so putting all of those together, lo and behold, you substitute one into the other, and now I have it. I have an equation that came from strict neoclassical economic principles that says that the income of one gener of, a, of an offspring is a function of the income of the parent and some sort of, of object that, uh, you know, in a, when you do a regression, it's called an error, and it, but when you think about it from the perspective of theory, is the heterogeneity that we, uh, that is, we treat as a, a random variable. Okay, previous assumptions are going to show that they, this is increasing in both arguments. All right, this actually gives you the, what is the, was the micro foundations for much of the intergenerational mobility literature, uh, you know, up to somewhere around uh, 1990, early 1990s. Okay, so one of the comments that I want to say is that, uh, you know, the mechanisms by which parental income matters for uh, offspring income in this model are fully elucidated. In other words, a parent's income doesn't matter because you give the money to the kid. It matters because you generate human capital in the child. Now, whether or not that's the right way to think about it, of course, is problematic. In other words, I think the recent research suggests that the parental influences aren't via formal investment the way this model is talking about them, but it's th through other factors. But for better or worse, this one has the mechanisms laid out. Uh, I do want to mention that Obviously, this model is extremely simple. I could think of much more elaborate models in which Asians are making decisions across time, and I want to build in more heterogeneity across the agents in terms of things such as preferences. Those become much more difficult objects to compute, and Dean Corbet's lectures will talk about how to analyze these models with richer forms of heterogeneity. And so even though his focus will not be on intergenerational mobility, the lectures are germane to them. Okay, now there is a key microeconomic assumption that was not made it clear here. And that is that the parents could not borrow against their children's income. In other words, I remember I start off by saying, you have some income, you split it between consumption and, uh, and, uh, uh, and the investment. Well, that begs the question, well, why don't I take out a loan, invest in my kids, and then have the kids pay the loan back? Well. These models r rule that out for the, you know, the trivial reason that you actually legally can't do that. In other words, I can't pre-commit my uh, child to uh, pay off debts that I've accrued. And the second point is that it obviously would be a moral hazard problem <laughs> in terms of whether the child chooses to, uh, to earn that. Okay, yes. Yeah. Is that a challenge that that is a sense that in a lot of developing countries, at least in poor families, children are viewed as assets. So you have a lot of children sitting there or as soon as the child gets to be can get a job, to encourage them to work in the college, to college because they can bring them to the home. So, so that abstraction in a sense kind of abstracts the a really important part of the problem. I think that so let me make two comments. One I don't think that that, it's, that that assumption is the one that I'd be so much worried about um, because what you need is a model in which there's overlap, the overlap, as it were, is, multiple, is over multiple time periods and the parents have some link to the kids so they could like, borrow against them when they're 13 because they're going to pay back when they're 14 and they control them at 13 and 14. So your, your issue more has to do with having a richer demographic structure. The second comment is the model I described was not designed to describe developing country persistence. And it is my view that one needs to have different models uh, to talk about uh, developing countries and understand those mechanisms. Okay, so, uh, it, 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 and I, but that's an important point. And it, it related to the ob observation I made earlier, you have to tailor the model to the phenomena you're talking about. And so if you want to understand uh, persistence in, uh, you want to understand intergenerational mobility in sub-Saharan Africa, I think you need very different models than you want for the United States. All right, now the key here is to note that what gives this bite is when that fee function is concave. And what that just means is that the marginal payoffs to education are, are diminishing. Because after all, if you think about it, uh, if you, you know, I, I, can pay, I, I can do anything, I invest as much as I want on my child, but if you can't, I should lend you the money because it tends to be a really high payoff to that and you can uh, give me a good return. And so the, 
what this means more generally is one has to think about credit constraints in the economy. So maybe uh, taking Peter's question a bit differently is what's being, you know, they just announced there are no markets is insufficient. Rather, one has to think much harder about the capacities of individuals to borrow. So if we talked about college, you wouldn't say to me that your parents' income completely controls what you can do. You'd say that there's lots of, you know, ways that you could borrow, uh, you know, at least partially against future income and the like. However, they, you know, these are not complete markets. They're cases in which there are going to be credit market restrictions. And that work is going to, and Jim is going to talk about that as well as Lance Lochner. And so what those lectures are going to deal with are both the issue of credit constraints, which creates a, a link between macro, as it were, and mobility. And second, they're going to talk about what's known about the human capital income link. Yes. I'm thinking about your actual experience too. Like even the structure of the school calendar, you have this huge celebrate, right? Like, I, I may be incorrect, but I believe that it was it was tied to the harvest time. And it was like during the harvest time, you wanted the kids to be away from school so they could help with the harvest. And so, like when we think about um, innovations in the educational systems, like the new school days or added number of days, which maybe in Asian countries but not in America, you have this holdover from. Yeah, so, so that, 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 that would be path dependent. I, I actually, uh, one of the virtues of having the internet is I looked up the uh, compulsory schooling laws when, when Jim was talking. So the uh, last state to pass a compulsory schooling law did was, you'll be shocked, Mississippi in 1917. Okay, 1917. Uh, pardon me, it was 14. I, I couldn't find uh, uh, in real time the, uh, when it moved up to 16. Okay, but again, everything you said is perfectly sensible, but I don't, the, the question is, how do, you know, I'll say the bottom line is criticism is good. Extending the model to account for these things is valuable, and these are the dimensions along which the model's limited. The reason I'm spending so much time on this model is this was how economists were thinking about intergenerational mobility for a pretty long time, and I wanted you also to see that this is what it means to actually write out as simple as it is a purely art, fully articulated model of, of preferences, constraints, blah, 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 in which you get exactly the phenomena, the object that people are calculating. Except for one little problem. That doesn't look like a linear regression to me. Uh, okay, and the serious point is, first ob observation is that just from the perspective of the most simple-minded economic theory, this intergenerational correlation coefficient is not a natural object. Really what you care about is the conditional distribution of incomes for offspring given a parent. That's a much more complicated object to talk about and that's where some of the more sophisticated econometrics literature comes from. The correlation coefficient, as, was brought, as you brought up, that, that masks things. In other words, because it's uh, treating everybody equally, it doesn't account for the fact that tails may be more persistent in the middle, and that's a sort of fact that's obviously enormously important. Uh, now, the other comment I wanted to make is that in talking about credit constraints, once you introduce ideas concerning early childhood investment, that opens up a whole new frontier, as it were. Because after all, you could ask the question, why couldn't I borrow money, at, you know, what capacity do I have as a, as a father with a three-year-old to put somebody in a preschool, to you know, buy books, so on and so forth. And so I think this issue of credit constraints, which is primarily focused on college, in fact is much broader. Another example would have to do with the capacity of individuals to purchase uh, memberships in units which uh, have good educational outcomes called school districts. And so once one expands the domain of explanations for what determines uh, offspring income, you begin to see how parental income can have many <laughs> channels and the notion of credit constraints becomes correspondingly more salient. Please. Now, let me just add a footnote here. Uh, apropos, there's some recent work, for example, by Fabio Cunha, working with some pediatrician And this reinforces work done by ethnographers and by anthropologists and other work, consistent with what Earl will be saying, the whole fully abductive approach to knowledge. But really, looking at the inventory of parental knowledge, about what best practice is. I mean, just literally, what is the best way to raise a child in the sense of encouraging a child? And it, a, there's a huge array, a lot of dispersion, a lot of ignorance. And so people like uh, uh, Jeffrey Canada and uh, Harlem's Children's Zone and many other people have featured that kind of the, the critical limitation is just knowledge 
a lot of the parents didn't know. The extreme case that I like to give is a group of Indians that I met with in Montreal. They'd all been raised in orphanages, so they, they were trying to determine what was the best, I mean, I didn't really have the answer, but the question was, what's a good parenting model, especially for people who never had parents? <laughs> so there really is a sense in which it's much more than just the income. And, uh, and, and, and other factors may play the dominant role. That's going to be a theme, I'll just I mean, come back to what Lance will talk about and I'll talk about it. It's yeah, kind I, of an open question. It's not settled, but it seems like it's far more important than, than the way the current economic models uh, think about it. I, I fully agree. So, uh, please. So, I feel like the, um, the parenting model that's the best is probably different for different people and in ways that parenting model that uh, privileges certain middle class values um, makes middle class kids more successful in schools, for example. Um, then, and since success in schools and resources in schools are limited, uh, there's competition for that. Well, yeah, I, not only would I agree with that, I'd say the, par the parenting style that's optimal depends on which child within a family. In other words, once you allow for heterogeneity of any type, it then asks the question, given th these, this configuration, what parenting style is best? It's not just heterogeneity, it's like so you, no, interactions you, between uh, people. Uh, but if they're identical. That, that's why I called it heterogeneity, because if there's two people, they don't have the same, they, they're not lockstep, that's all I meant. So I, I know yeah. it's heterogeneity, but I, I, I think the idea is, if I can put some words on it, I think it's heterogeneity within a context. Yeah. So you have to think about individual heterogeneity or family heterogeneity, but then they're finding themselves in different social contexts with different social norms. And so then you have to think about the possible matches and the possible conflicts. So there's a big variance. Yeah. Well, that, that's what I do my research on, so I fully agree. You're right. Most important thing that's imaginable. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So I want to make a couple of comments about going beyond this row um, and why this is an inadequate summary measure. Um, I think that a better, you know, the, the, you know, really the questions we're asking have to do with if you observe a certain level of inequality contemporaneously, what do you know dynamically? And what the, the intergenerational correlation approach is doing is it's forcing you to think linearly about that question. And it's ignoring, first of all, nonlinearities, and second, things outside of income that are relevant to, uh, to forecasting that. So one object you could compute, you could think about, I mentioned before, which is I could ask the question, given a contemporaneous income difference, and I could put whatever other conditioning variables I want, tell me what the expected values are of the uh, income differences for descendants. So again, thinking about the family dynasties. Okay, and this would allow you to talk about persistence of inequality over any horizon. And in fact, then you could take the limit of that and ask the qu a question of the form. Is it the case that if I observe an expected value is greater than, you know, there's a gap between you? In the indefinite future, I think there's going to be a gap. That's kind of my kappa point. This is actually the, one of the definitions of convergence in the economic growth literature. And there's been mysteriously a lack of, uh, of use of all of the work on convergence in economic growth to interpret intergenerational uh, mobility. But they're mathematically the same object. So, that, so this is one way of thinking about how you can even get permanent inequality. The idea I observe contemporaneous inequality, I form expect, expected values, and uh, uh, it, it, I don't expect it ever to disappear. Furthermore, I could ask questions which are more explicitly probabilistic. So, you know, a, you know here would be an example to say, suppose I observe a, uh, a family is in poverty, what's the probability that the descendants will be in poverty over some number of generations? Okay, again, that would be an object to compute that tells us something about the persistence of a disadvantaged state. And if you take that limit as t goes to infinity, uh, that would tell you something about what we might mean by a poverty trap. So one property trap, it might be uh, a very mechan mechanical one that says if you're poor, that's it. <laughs> All the descendants are, are guaranteed to be poor. It turns out that once you write down richer models, you can actually get probabilities between 0 and 1. And so uh, 
but, but again, that's very important. See, probability zero means there's no trap. Uh, any other probability says there's some chance that you're going to get trapped. And the richer economic models actually have this property that, it, you know, nothing's guaranteed, but the problem is that poverty creates sufficient disadvantage that builds up enough persistence in income across generations that there is a positive probability that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't go away. Now, you might say, well, how could it be between, how, how could that happen? The intuition to have in your head is that the mechanisms we talk about that map the parental socioeconomic status, the offspring socioeconomic status, once we enrich them, you know, and thinking about all these different family mechanisms can make that extremely, you know, very, very tight links. On the other hand, once you think about shocks uh, to individuals, in other words, somebody, the von Neumann is born with poor parents, et cetera, suddenly, you know, you have to have a different vision of what it means to talk about persistence. And so, in essence, when you write down the, these, these, you know, well-defined behavioral models, but they do have uh, stochastic elements in them, uh, what is happening is you, uh, in some cases, when the, uh, the tight, the strength of the uh, transi transmission from parent to child is strong enough, you can get these, uh, these types of processes. All right. So that, uh, these are examples of uh, what are called non-ergodic systems, that's just jargon. All right, the thing I do want to emphasize is that much of, you know, is that it is critical if you're writing down models of intergenerational mobility that you actually put in stochastic elements because they can give very different properties to, <laughs> than the mechanistic analogs. So to give you a, a really silly example, um, suppose there were only two income states, high and low, and the way the world worked is with probability one, if you're high, your kids are high, low, kids are low. Okay, there's perfect poverty trap, once you're poor, you're a perfect low income trap. Uh, if I introduce just a, a smidgen of uncertainty, in other words, rather than have probability one, zero, zero, one, it was one minus uh, delta, 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 one minus delta. That one, with probability one, everybody, all the dynasties exhibit exactly the same average behavior, no matter how small delta is. Now, the mean first passage times may be very long, and that's one of the objects that really ought to be computed. Uh, but the point is, you have to be very careful when you're writing down these theoretical models because once you introduce uncertainty, it can really qualitatively change the properties of the system. And so one thing that is needed, I think, are more robust measures that more naturally move between the two. And that's why the slides, which I'm going to skip over, talk about uh, thinking about mean first passage times and other statistics that might get, be more natural objects for understanding persistence. Uh, the final comment I wanted to make, and this hasn't been done yet, is I could ask the following question. I sort of have a family dynasty, and I could ask the question, suppose that all the future shocks were set equal to zero. Now this presupposes I have a natural normalization of what the shocks mean. They just don't exist. Are there mechanisms in the society slash economy that have the property that in absence of the shocks, you would get reversion across time? Or are the shocks necessary to get the crisscrossing of the future family dynasties. Now, that means you actually have to construct a, you know, a, a, an object that doesn't exist. In other words, the hypothetical trajectories of families in absence of the shocks. And it turns out that what this can do is, uh, uh, you could ask questions such as, given a family's income, is the long-term, the descent, long-term descendants income dependent on the current family income if there were no shocks, and if it is, then that is what uh, I would call path dependence. And I think this at least formalizes an idea that you see in economic history all the time. And the reason that I emphasize this is one of the, to me, one of the substantive social science questions is whether or not society slash economy has mechanisms built into it that are going to attenuate contemporaneous inequality across generations, or do you have to rely on the von Neumann effect, as it were? In other words, you need these future shocks kicking in to kill off the contemporaneous inequalities. So there's a lot of stuff that can be computed like that. How should we think about the shocks that are going to support Well, one, one would be ability. Um, another, uh, for better, would be luck. In other words, um, turns out that the uh, whatever attributes you have, the uh, market rate of return is, uh, is high on them. Uh, again, that one of the difficulties in doing this is you have to actually write, you have to now take a stance on what the unobserved heterogeneity means. And, but I merely put that on the table as just something to think about. Yes? So, how come 
which will be a possible channel to introduce, uh, for example, state intervention in this kind of world? Okay, let me uh, pick up the pace and get to that in a, uh, in a few minutes. Okay. So I should say that n none of these proposals in the uh, slides for ways to measure persistence have been done by anybody. Uh, the only, uh, what has been done is to do things such as calculate, uh, and this is from a paper by uh, Bhattacharya and Mazumdar, which uh, is in the bibliography to the slides, in which you ask the questions, you divide the population into 5% uh, uh, increments, and you ask kind of what's the probability if you're in the bottom 5% that your offspring will be at least as high as you. And so those are the uh, numbers for whites and blacks with associated confidence intervals. One important feature of this is it tells you that, uh, that you know, African Americans, there's kind of less, uh, uh, less uh, upward mobility, as it were, than there is for, uh, for, uh, for whites. Now, this type of fact actually is of ancient lineage. Uh, and I actually put in a uh, table from a 1967 book on uh, American occupations uh, by Blau and Duncan. Uh, and the only thing I wanted to point out was this number here, which was so that in 67 they were looking at southern non-whites and asking, and, and what they did is they created an index of uh, occupational prestige and used that as the thing to talk about mobility. And what was interesting was this outline statistic right here, which was the southern blacks, there was a very high probability whatever success you've achieved, your kids were going to do substantially worse. This is an important theme, I think, in, uh, in thinking that, that comes out of the nonlinear literature as it exists, which is that e the capacity of African Americans to transmit economic success to their offspring is, is lower than Caucasians. Now, obviously, there's many re ways you'd want to interpret that. A trivial one would simply say that the measure is inadequate. In other words, it's one thing to talk about my income versus my children's. It's a separate thing to talk about my income and my wealth. And so that could help explain it. But the point is that the statistics themselves suggest an important difference uh, across the ethnicities. All right. So again, I focused entirely on income. I do want to make an observation. There's papers about many different objects in intergenerational persistence and mobility. Uh, I want to be clear. I don't endorse any empirical papers uh, uh, that I'm about to talk about. I don't mean that to be mean. It's merely the difficult identification issues. I want you to know what's in the literature and uh, not uh, what my opinions are. So one example is, uh, is the transmission of crime. It turns out that you control for the usual suspects. If you want to predict the probability that somebody is arrested for a crime, given the fact that their parent has spent time in jail, you get the uh, following numbers from Helmerson and Lindquist that it's probably about twice as high. Okay. Another example would be non-marital fertility. And so uh, this uh, paper in press by Hognes and Carlson finds using a proportional hazards model where you sort of ask between the ages 15 and 44, will you ever have a kid out of wedlock? The probability if your mother uh, was, you were, uh, had a non-marital first, uh, first, non first birth, the probability goes up between 16 and 44 percent depending on the model. That's a very large range and that should be a hint. The various models we have of intergenerational mobility are all quote unquote open-ended. In other words, the thought, empirical thought experiments is people put in controls that they have some intuition ought to be there, but the results can be, fluctuate quite a bit because of the choice of controls. So without a, a, uh, a coherent theory as to what the co controls are, this is one of the sources of the heterogeneity in the empirical literature, and there, there are techniques to, to address it, but you have to be aware that it's not that any of the papers are wrong or any of the models are wrong. They're simply uh, is, is the fact of the matter is there's many explanations for something like mobility or this, any given phenomena and different authors make different admitted, and to be blunt ad hoc choices often as to what they think is important or what, what is important to control for and what is not. All right, final example is cigarette smoking. Uh, you will not be shocked to find out that you're much, uh, again, controlling for other things, much more likely to smoke uh, if your parents do. All right, now I want, I want you to notice was Let's suppose that these were the generative mechanisms in the following sense. That's the only thing that persists across generations. Each one of them would generate intergenerational persistence and in income, potentially. And the reason for that, uh, let's just take the first one. Crime, you know, the bottom line is for most uh, criminals, crime doesn't pay. It's not a, it's not a good career. <laughs> in other words, you're not going to do well. Uh, and so if you're transmitting criminal behavior, that would generate persistence in incomes, even though there was nothing to do with incomes per se. 
Single parent households are much disadvantaged economically, so that clearly by itself would generate the income correlations. And I could even, and this is pushing a little bit harder, argue that smoking has an effect to the extent that health, smoking has an adverse effect on health and therefore because of a health income link. So, so you're going to talk about the mechanisms of these? Oh, no, so, so the next slide is to say why, that I'm not. Okay, what I wanted you to see was the following, and that is I could have a theory that just talked about why there was intergenerational persistence in one of these behaviors, and that could have the reflection that generated intergenerational persistence in income. That said, each one of those is a behavior, and therefore all I've done is push the explanation back one unit. And so what's really needed is to have a common behavioral framework in which we can talk about how these different mechanisms determine income and think about the different choices as a unified uh, set of decisions that individuals make based on you know, the way they form beliefs, preferences, constraints, so on and so forth. Okay, so but the key, uh, the observation I wanted to make was to note that you know, by itself in, I could generate income correlations even if the transmission mechanism had nothing to do with income. All right, so let me, as I said. Uh, how, far, how far down the trail are we? Like crime, how much of it is the absence of income? You, the, you've, you've already gone beyond where the literature is. I mean, the, these are very, I don't want to be, these are still very crude empirical studies that looked, again, in isolation at one object. And they may have some control variables. And so what I was reporting was controlling for income. These were, you know, the probability differences. Okay. So uh, James Foster is going to be talking in much more detail about issues of measurement and is going to obviously expand the domain of, of ways to measure inequality far beyond the sorts of objects I've talked about. I just wanted to give you a little flavor for the subset on intergenerational mobility. Please. But, I mean, if, if you go beyond the income and you, like, narrowed down to, for example, crime or smoking. There are literature in there explaining this kind of um, perpetuation, like, for example, social interaction. So is that like the literature is like explaining this thing, by like going from these specific behaviors to income? No, that has not been done yet. I, again, what I gave you was theory. I meant that is, in theory, all of the income work could simply be reflecting other behaviors. And so this is the level of crudity, if you'll forgive me, at which the empirical literature is working. In other words, it's not looking at mechanisms. It's not distinguishing clearly between stuff that's manipulatable versus simply that one behavior leads to a particular outcome. Okay, so the, really I want you to take all this as statements of all these research opportunities on intergenerational mobility that, that have yet to be exploited. Okay, I so... the politics does. Pardon me? No, the policy does. Yeah. The policy of the politics is really looking at these correlations and saying, ah. Exactly. Right, it's English. Okay, so okay, we're going to hear a lot more about it in the next six months, but I think that that's why this discussion is so relevant. It may be, I'm not denying it, Maybe something about an equality percentage that causes difficulty. I'm not denying that either. I'm saying there are other hypotheses that are equally interesting or at least potentially interesting. We need to be eliminated. Unless we just, you know, throw, you know, we have this kind of very important policy, just throwing money at problems. You know, but it's an open question. All right. Well, some people have strong views. No, I, I completely agree with you. Okay, so that was the first class of models. They all focus on income. What my examples told you is they're inadequate. What you really want, if you're gonna even, even if it's just a family focus, what you might wanna think about are models in which incomes depend on the parent's income, other characteristics the individual has, and then the usual suspect of shocks. But then I need to have another set of things that I want to explain. In other words, the evolution of non-cognitive skills, the evolution of cognitive skills, so on and so forth. So from this perspective, it's just an algebraic triviality to, to write down a richer model. But what they substantively does, it gives you a, a very different perspective on what is generating intergenerational uh, persistence or lack thereof. Okay, so uh, I just did want to make a couple of comments. One, one literature uh, which existed and died out had to do with trying to uh, use genetics to explain uh, 
income differences. And to be honest, it was trying to it was, it was being used to try to explain differences in incomes between races. And um, what the literature did is it would take some outcome, omega, and it, this is by assumption, is that it, that it depended on the sum of three terms, some genetic thing called A, something called family, uh, ba the effect of the family called C, and something called E, which was non-shared environment. That basically distinguishes two kids in the same family. And in these calculations, uh, based on ad, ad hoc orthogonality assumptions uh, in order to sort of uh, achieve identification, this is what Jim referred to before. The typical claim was that the variance of some outcome of interest depends on the variance of the genetic component and the variance of the idiosyncratic environmental component. No role for families and further, they were equal to each other. All right, what all I want to say here is that um, this work has been extremely harshly criticized by economists. All the work that's made claims on racial differences, I, I, I believe uh, uh, would be impossible to make a credible empirical case for. So in other words, that's all failed. All right, the overarching problem is simply the lack of thinking about social science. What the literature did, does, the classical literature, is it did variance decompositions based on a made-up additive model and then tried to take the leap to talk about uh, 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 actual causal mechanisms. And so it's not surprising that that failed. I should mention that in addition, I'm going to take the liberty of touting work that uh, Wars Wallace uh, and I are doing, uh, which actually found some, there's actually some uh, logical inconsistencies in the claims about genetic differences between races, and that is that they confuse first and second moments. So in other words, the calculations assume the first moments are the same for the races, and then they uh, use the uh, variance decomposition to conclude that, uh, that, the, that they aren't. And so what are the, that's an example of the crude level at which the literature is evolving, or evolved. But that, that I think is all dead, okay? What, is, what I think is a promising area is looking at where kind of genetics currently is and, and behavioral genetics is, which is focusing on gene-environment interactions. In other words, getting rid of this notion of additivity. And, uh, uh, you know, and then what's, you know, kind of the, the uh, shishi, uh, the, uh, the cool thing to talk about, which is epigenetics. And so epigenetics, to give you a really crude definition, the idea is that in utero, the, uh, the experience of the mother determines which genes are expressed in the offspring. And so what that means is that the mother's environment can have an effect on what the actual phenotype is. And so you don't get this one-to-one -one mapping from the thing called D the initial DNA to, to, the, to the baby. And what that does is it gives a role for the mother's environment to, to express itself. Now, yeah, you, know, there's, you know, this is controversial in terms of humans, but let me just uh, 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 leave it there. I did want to make a couple of comments, and that is that if one is focusing on the family in isolation, one can't ignore, even though I did it in the initial models, issues of marriage. In other words, assorted of mating is a fundamental question. And of course, a sort of matching uh, in general is going to matter in thinking about these things. Uh, it matters if you're going to make genetic claims, it's going to matter if you're going to make income claims, educational claims, et cetera, in terms of the transmission mechanisms. And so both Pierre Andre Chiapori and Lona Smith's lectures will focus on aspects of matching. Chiapori will be more interested in the details of how families inter, uh, make decisions collectively, you know, how resources are allocated. Lonos will be more concerned about matching issues. So it won't just be how a sort of how marriage uh, markets, quote unquote, work. It's going to have to do with how uh, matching to firms, matching to neighborhoods, et cetera, work. And so uh, also the fecundity matters. So uh, it's just something to keep in mind. Even though the Queen Elizabeth is a direct descendant of William the Conqueror, almost all of William the Conqueror's descendants are in complete obscurity. So once you begin to introduce serious demography, you have to start asking the questions differently about what you would mean in terms of persistence. Uh, and that, as far as I know, economists haven't thought about. Okay, so let me skip. So bottom line is I did want to, you know, there isn't enough known on the genetic side to warrant lectures in 2012. I hope in 2013 there's a different answer, but who knows? Let me just say, I'm not going to say it's known, but I mean, there is a lot of claim. I think it's important to leave the state. I mean, there's still, I mean, we heard papers as recently as uh, January of uh, 2012 having the ADA meetings claiming 
you know, evidence of heritability, right? In the social genetics, the behavioral genetics where heritability is about 0.5. They get moderated somewhat by family experience, down to 0.3 when you actually look at adversity. And it governs a lot of, this huge amount of work. I and mean, your, your friend, uh, George Mason. Uh, it's not my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Simply saying, you know, heritability is explaining 50%. Parenting plays almost no role whatsoever. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you look at the studies uh, from genes, genetic studies, we're getting almost no effect of uh, parental environment. So it's included in that in. So, so it's a fair statement. As, as, and I'm a lot of what you're talking about is a lot of what this whole notion of family influence and these other models is kind of irrelevant that we're kind of genetically determined. Yeah. Maybe what I wanted to sort of conceitedly say is not enough passes the Durloff dash Heckman uh, quality criterion that we could give uh, that it made sense to give lectures. In other words, there's a lot of work. Yeah. No, no, that's all fair. But I. I think that's the point. Is why we should be taking these experiences, right? I mean, we we should be trying to under you know to to get at these mechanisms, right? So I think being aware that there's lots of work out there is absolutely important. I think the claims are strong. A lot of economists are saying. Larry Summers is saying. Yeah, well, I have a counter to Larry Summers now. We do. We have counters to Larry Summers now. We have people who are doing work that are, you know, trying to, that are looking at the environment. So it's, like, it, it, it's I think it's perfect that we should be aware of that this work is going on, and we should also be aware of how we should be doing better work to counter the economics, some kinds of claims. That we're but also just understand the nature of the evidence. You know, twin sets, right? Minnesota twin sets. I just didn't perceive that there's a, I mean, let, let, oh, the, it's, the literature's active. Let, let me just move on because let, 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 I'll, I'll make it more narrow. I didn't think there should be any lectures because there's too much shoddy work. Okay. <laughs> All right. The fi I, I do want to finish in three minutes so people can have lunch. Okay. Uh, the final thing I wanted to say is that the, okay, it, you know, final point, of course, is that these models, as I've described them, ignore social context. In other words, that's another kind of fundamental limitation. And so there is a literature, this is the social interactions literature I will uh, uh, lecture on, which I claim is a, a good faith effort to introduce sociological ideas into economics. Now, we have three judges to whether they think uh, it was a success, but I can tell you what the intent is. Basically, the point is to say that if you're writing down models in which there's intergener, you know, of you know, family dynasties and the like, you have to think about a whole plethora of social influences that matter. Okay, metaphorically, one way to think about the difference is that the becker tomes approach said the parent literally buys human capital and gives it to the kid. It's a private education economy. The sort of neighborhood models that Roland Benabou and I uh, separately have developed would say that the only, well, in their extreme form, were the only reason parents' income matters because that influences what neighborhood a kid grows up in and therefore the quality of schools, who their peers are, so on and so forth. And so this social literature uh, takes a, a very different view on what the generative mechanism would be for the transmission. Okay, so given that, uh, basically there's going to be two ideas that float around. One of them is that somehow when you write down the, uh, fam the income generation process, in addition to parental income, all the other factors we've talked about, I need to put in measures of, of social context that occurred both in childhood and adulthood. Now the reason you want to distinguish them for example, as you could imagine that a, a child's uh, effort in school may be affected by what role models you see. If you don't see people with the same skin color that are doctors, to say you should aspire to be a doctor is a meaning, to me a meaningless statement. All right, and so, you know, instantiation of role model ideas in economics is just one example, into these models is one example of how social influences would matter in youth. An example in adulthood would be social networks and their role in information transmission. So, you know, about half of all jobs in the U.S the person, when you take them, you know somebody at the place that you work. So in other words, even in a very information rich economy, the flow of information across networks matters. And so, but that's something you would think about at an adult level. 
Okay, so those would be examples where, uh, again, you sort of think about the, the parent is purchasing group membership, so to speak, be it a neighborhood, be it a school, so on and so forth. The final thing in which you would want to uh, think about behaviors is to say that uh, incomes themselves in a community affect each individual. So in other words, it may, if you think about what's going to affect my kids, it's not just my income, that's also the incomes of all of my neighbors. Now why would that happen? One could be the role model effects. Uh, even though I preferred having college professors as neighbors to uh, rich people because I wanted a, a different uh, social interaction. Uh, another example would simply be local finance of public schools. Even though the evidence is not strong on the relationship between per pupil expenditures and education, nevertheless, the structure of local public finance in the U.S. creates a mapping from the distribution of incomes in a community to, uh, uh, to uh, human capital formation. Okay, now this one one has to be quite careful about because it's not just the mean that matters, the distribution matters. Why? Because you then have to think about political economy, what the median voters' preferences are with respect to taxes and human capital. And then it gets even more complicated if they're private school options. And so you have in, uh, in, in some cities, I think Chicago's one of them, a mass withdrawal of the more affluent families from the public school system. Well, guess what their optimal tax rate is for schools? Zero. Okay, and so those types of complications all come into play. All right, the upshot of all that is uh, you can generate poverty traps uh, in these types of models actually quite, quote unquote, quite easily when there's a sufficient interdependence across the members of a population. However, the way you think about the poverty trap is different. In other words, all it is is a statistical regularity in the, in the group. And what I mean by that is these models, because of all the interdependences in them across individuals, they can have multiple average behaviors that are self-consistent equilibria. And so the notion of a poverty trap is defined by the group to say that you no know, individual is trapped. Uh, it's merely saying that the group collectively will uh, exhibit more than one behavior. And I will talk about those models in detail uh, in, the, in the other lectures. Okay, there's many mechanisms that generate uh, uh, social effects. Uh, this afternoon you're going to hear about uh, one that I, uh, as I think I told Rachel, most, most ideas when I think about them more I'm less impressed. The, more I, the case of the identity work every time I think about it I think it's more and more important. Uh, now of course that means that it's only a compliment if you kind of think my, my common sense is worth anything but let me leave that aside. Uh, the point I want to make is this is a very important idea which, which is that when we think about behaviors what the akerlof cranton framework does is it actually alters how we want to think about decisions at the core. And what I mean by that is econo speak, you specify preferences, constraints, beliefs, you have an optimal decision. It's a tautology. The identity work has the idea that one of the things I want to do, or it, 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 and it may be partially volitional, may not, is choose an identity. And that choose an identity has associated with a set of behaviors. And so depending on what that portfolio of behaviors is, I can get very different outcomes for population subgroups. And so when people talk about uh, you know, problems such as acting white, there's a controversial idea there uh, having to do with uh, uh, the educational gap between uh, African American boys and, uh, and Caucasian boys. That can be interpreted using the identity framework. Again, I'm not going to endorse the empirical work, but I want you to see that it is a very different way to think about how people make choices and can lead to very different uh, uh, implications for what it means to talk about intergenerational mobility. Uh, by the way, the, you know, there is suggestive evidence of these things, uh, of, of the acting white phenomena. It is highly controversial. Some people have criticized it. There's also work, for example, on how Appalachian youths suffer from the same phenomena. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then within sociology, I think one of the more exciting research programs by Robert Sampson on something called collective efficacy which he defines as social cohesion defined, sh combined with shared expectations for social control. And what that's saying is that neighborhoods have a rich social structure that affects individual outcomes and that can affect what is persistence in socioeconomic status. So an example of high social efficacy is do I call my fr neighbor and tell them their kid has skipped school? Okay, that may sound like a triviality for an individual, but if a community is doing that, they're enforcing informally certain types of behaviors that will affect the transmission of economic or socioeconomic status across generations. I should say that the Samson work has not been investigated by economists. In other words, there are no formal models that 
that have tried to take his ideas and embed them in the algebra that we, we like. Uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't. Okay, so at the end of the day, one ends up with a very complicated system. In other words, if we think about the incomes of, of the offspring depend on the parent's income, all these other characteristics which the uh, parents can influence, contextual effects in both t t times of life, kind of what the, whatever group an individual is a member of, what their incomes and behaviors are like at both times, as well as the shocks. And that's what the social interactions literature is all about, it's just writing down formal models of that form uh, and seeing what the theoretical implications are, and then on the other side asking how in God's name can you possibly identify these different uh, phenomena given, uh, uh, given observational data. The good news is uh, it's better than you think. Now, I don't have any, uh, uh, any, any empirical evidence on the role of social factors on intergenerational mobility because it doesn't exist. I'll just point out a few things that might be interesting to think about. One of them is the huge difference in non-marital fertility between whites and blacks. If you want to understand persistent inequality between races, that is something that has to be addressed. It's not a moral judgment, it's just a factual statement. Here's another example which I, I wanted you to see, and that is if you look at uh, teenage smoking rates, uh, you divide male, female, and by ethnicity, there's also an outlier. It's black females don't smoke. Now the reason I give you that one is that it's important uh, I'll give you, and a third example is language. This is in some sense the most trivial one to talk about social effects. For example, you know, uh, the accents of children are driven by communities, not parents. And so that's why the children of immigrants t typically do not have accents. Uh, there's a massive amount of work in sociolinguistics, uh, on the so which basically on the social determination of pronunciation, grammar, and the like. If you ask, does it matter economically? Well, there is some evidence that the use of African-American vernacular English, you know, black English, does have effects on labor market outcomes. Now, one thing to be clear about, African-American vernacular English is as grammatically correct as quote-unquote standard English, whatever that is. In other words, it really has some very slight differences in pronunciation and slightly different grammatical rules, but it's equally rule-based, so on and so forth, and obviously it's completely comprehensible to uh, a, what I'm calling, I call the standard English speaker, and so understanding why it has these labor market outcomes, I think, is, uh, is very much up in the air. Okay, as I said, I want to be clear, none of this was causal evidence, but this was at least suggestive as to why sort of social factors could matter for objects that have uh, uh, intergenerational influences. So, bottom line is, uh, this is really, uh, from the perspective of economists, a remarkably uh, undeveloped literature. There's no comprehensive vision of what determines intergenerational mobility. There are many, many papers that use atheoretical models to sort of say, well, this factor may matter, or then another pa model paper, this factor may matter. But in terms of having an integrated vision, that just doesn't exist uh, yet. Uh, and that, to me, is the big challenge. There's a number of interesting theoretical models that are either family-based or group-based. Uh, the generalization of the group-based would be social network-based. But uh, it seems to me the integration to a coherent view is the uh, difficult future direction that uh, needs to be taken. So let me stop there so you can have lunch. Uh, okay, thank you.